Hello and welcome to today's edition of Quoted, the Quoted podcast. I'm your host, uh, Sufian Christian. Uh, I'm joined by Carl Milsom again. Hi, Carl. Hello. Great to have you. I wasn't trying to be funny there at all. Glad, really glad to be back. Brilliant to have you here. Uh, we're going through uh, John Taylor Gattle's book, Dumbing Us Down. Last week we did the lesson, the first lesson, which is Confusion. And uh, today's lesson is uh, class position. So if you see me looking off, I'm just looking at uh, the text here. I'm not actually ignoring you guys out there. Please remember to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And um, all the stuff is on the link below somewhere around there (laughs) in the ether. So that's all good. So without further ado, I'm I'm gonna start. So the second lesson, is class position. So Gatto says, the second lesson I teach is class position. I teach that students must stay in the class where they belong. I don't know who decides my kids belong there, but that's none of my business. The children are numbered so that if any get away, they can be returned to the right class. Over the years, The variety of ways children are numbered by schools has increased dramatically until it's hard to see the human beings plainly under the weight of numbers they carry. Numbering children is a big and very profitable undertaking, though what the strategy is designed to accomplish is elusive. I don't even know why parents would, without a fight, allow it to be done to their kids. In any case, That's not my business. My job is to make them like being locked together with children who bear numbers like their own, or at least endure it like good sports. If I do my job well, the kids can't even imagine themselves somewhere else because I've shown them how to envy and fear the better classes and how to have contempt for the dumb classes. Under this efficient discipline, the class mostly polices itself into good marching order. That's the real reason, that's the real reason of any rigged competition like school. You come to know your place. In spite of the overall class blueprint, which assumes that 99% of the kids are in their class to stay, I nevertheless make a public effort to exhort children to higher levels of test success, hinting at eventual transfer from the lower class as a reward. I frequently insinuate the day will come when an employer will hire them on the basis of test scores and grades, even though my own experience is that employers are rightly indifferent to such things. I never lie outright, but I've come to see that truth and schooling are, at the bottom, incompatible. So at bottom, incompatible, just as Socrates said thousands of years ago. The lesson of numbered classes is that everyone has a proper place in the pyramid and there is no way out of your class except by number magic. Failing that, you must stay where you are put. And that's the end of that lesson there, class position. And, uh, you know, like I said last week, you know, when, when, I, when I read the whole, all seven lessons, you know, it just hit me like a hammer over the head because I was thinking I can remember, you know, going through Right. You know, all that, and especially this thing about, you know, the class position. When I was in secondary school, and then we had like Alpha and Beta, and they were like the, the top classes. Right. And then our class was just like, you know, Form A, and then it was Form B, and it was just like, well, yeah. why have we got, we like, why, are we, why haven't we got a name? Right. You know, how come we're not something or, or another? Why Alpha and Beta? And, to those kids there. So that's where that, you can see that contempt for them was there where those kids didn't do anything. Yeah, they just yeah. went up and you know, they were pretty bright at certain things. So they were put there and we were, you know, different. You know, we obviously had our qualities. We were put where we were put. So right. we had contempt for them. Um, and that's really sad because if something is built like that to elicit that type of re- reaction, again that filters into society to think well that person's better than me or they're cleverer than me because they've gone to this university or they've gone to that school 
when if that child is engaged in that, that that that's okay. But really, the child's just a passenger, really. In that instance, it's only until they get older and then they come out and then they can make their own choices. Then that's where it changes. But yeah, really, really powerful lesson. Really, really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, um, in fact, before before I comment on it, before I re reply to you, something I was thinking just that I don't think we mentioned last week, and it really hit me more this week, I think, than than last time, um, is the style of writing or the style. I mean, it was a speech when he first delivered it, and then it becomes the the opening chapter of his book, of course. Um, but the the style of language that he uses, and to speak in the first person the way he does, is really evocative. Um, because it's, it's spoken as though, obviously it's in the first person, it's spoken as though he's the teacher that does this, uh, and it's spoken in a very assertive way and a very bold and stark way. Um, and it was, a uh, reading it as a speech. In fact, I don't know if, if the, if the speech is available anywhere. I don't know if you've heard it in speech form. I haven't. I've tried to, I've yeah, tried I've not to seen it. it. Yes, that's, that's going to be like... Because I can imagine, because, you know, he doesn't he doesn't introduce it in any way, right? It just begins. And, yeah. like, I know from, from my experience, because I've tried on, like, on LinkedIn and a couple of other places, I've tried occasionally to put a post out there from the voice of, you know, some of the, 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 the people that I, I'm critiquing, you know, and I think, oh, let's write it from that perspective. And it doesn't pick up people don't get it and so you get all these really angry responses because people don't get that it's a parody um yeah. and i would have loved to have seen you know just what kind of response he got when he went going at it so straight faced uh so assertive from this voice it's a parody you know basically but i wonder if people sitting in the audience were kind of scratching their heads and wondering what he was getting at. i wonder how it was received because it's a bold move to come out yeah. swinging that way um and and you know not not to frame it not to introduce it not to say by the way i'm joking but just to, to yeah. go straight at it i'd love to see that in the in its original form well the thing is is um I've, when i when i first came across it and then i and then i sort of typed it on on a Google search and then there was a teacher who said that she actually left the profession after reading that. Okay. You know, and that yeah. was because she equated, she understood what it meant and she knew that she had done that to right. students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just like, I can't do this anymore. And it's something that's so learned because, you know, as you well know, you know, being a teacher yourself, you know, sometimes just instinctively, even unconsciously without thinking, you do things that are, you know, there's five more to come. You're going to think, you're going to think yeah. wow, I actually did that. And yeah. I don't even think about doing it. And it's just something that you've yeah. learned and then someone's taught you, but that, that person has been taught as well. And yeah. it's, it's so nice. Yeah, no, so, you're exactly right. And there's something about being a teacher and teaching in the, you know, being in the in the teaching profession that is, I always think it's a bit unique. Um, and the only other thing that's really like it is being a parent in the sense yeah. that we, all we have to go on is our own teachers. Just like when you have kids and you're, you become a parent, all you have to go on is is your parents. And you either decide that your parents did a good job and you want to copy them, or you think they did a bad job and you want to do the opposite. Um, you know, there are books out there, but who wrote these books? Only other people just like you, right? And it's the same with teaching for the most part. Um, most people who are teachers, they just do what their teachers did. They perpetuate because why wouldn't you? You spent 12 years in school being taught a particular way, your most formative years, every day you would go to school and be indoctrinated into this way of learning and for most students the impact that that has on them is as a student and then they graduate from school and they leave it behind but a small handful of them those people become become teachers themselves and the impact that it has then is it informs them how to become teachers how to teach and for the most part it just keeps the cycle going and occasionally you get a teacher and you know i like to think that i'm one of those teachers who breaks out of it and sees it as you know, something about that was not good. Now, for me, it's because I didn't really like school. And so when I became a teacher, um, you know, 
my approach to teaching was predicated on the fact that I didn't have a good teaching, a uh, good learning experience. I didn't have a good school experience. And I want to, when I'm as a teacher myself now, I want to do something different. But obviously it's, it's logical. It makes sense that most people who become teachers become teachers because they enjoyed school. They had a good school experience. And so, you know, it worked for them. They were happy for the most part. So when they become teachers, they think, well, I'll just keep that going. Um, and you know, the small minority that really love school are of course the, the people who are likely to become teachers, just like the small minority that really loves maths will go on to be mathematicians. It's always the minorities that enter the profession. Um, and, and so, you know, the teaching profession is populated by the minority that loved school and couldn't wait to be teachers. And it, of course it perpetuates and, you know, as you said, a lot of teachers might not even spend that much time really contemplating whether what they're doing is right or good or not, because, well, that's how I was taught. It worked yeah. for me and you just keep it going. And that I think really comes through in these lessons by, uh, by Gatto. It's so obviously a, a, an enshrined and deeply established system that just keeps going. And that's the teacher that he's, that he's parodying, you know? Because yeah. the thing is, as well, you know, when you think about it, there are, you know, you see even now where, you know, you know like foundation class and, you know, there's like another name yeah. for it, for the higher lot. So those kids that are in the foundation part, yeah. they think that there's something wrong with them. Yeah. And they think that the foundation is just like, well, like, no, is there something? And it's like, no, like, when you when you when you learn to drive like when you when you pass your driving test the first day you don't go out and go and get like you know um a ford gt or something like that you know you don't you you, you just don't do that like right. you go you get a little banger you know like 500 quid thousand yeah, pounds exactly. little little banger get used to driving in traffic and doing all that so then when it's the right time it might be a week and you're like right. i've got this down pack i know exactly what i'm doing you go out you go and get your ma whatever it is and you're flying but yeah. if it's just like well no like you have to still drive a banger for like five years yeah because that's the way it's done that's the system that's the way it's yeah. done you know and yeah. then there's the and then after that you'll graduate up to a slightly better car and then you slightly know, better banger. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah, exactly I mean? right. yeah. yeah. yeah but exactly then there's right. some other cats over here and they've just walked into it because they showed some really good aptitude and they're pretty good. Yeah. But but I know how to drive though. Yeah. So yeah. why can't I get a little taste of what because if you give me a little taste of what that is about, that might inspire me yeah. to you yeah. know no, that's learn a, I mean, more and do things differently. Yeah, I think last week in particular, we talked, you know, we saw um, how the system, the, the way the schools are set up doesn't really mirror or represent the way the rest of the world is, right? So the school that functions in a particular way, and we're seeing it again with this, I think, if you look at a career progression, if you look at somebody who starts their job, you know, kind of as an intern or, a, you know, the, the, whatever the, the bottom level of the ladder is, you know, um, to progress through that, different people move at different paces and you get people who stay at the kind of operator level that the entry level they stay there for their whole life either because they don't have the aptitude if we're honest about it that's true for some people but also yeah. because they're happy there that they you know that's that they, they've reached their ambition was you know i want a job that pays a bill and you know feeds my family and that's it and you know those people uh, you know I, i've worked with people like that i'm sure you have you know, those people I'm far more interested in what happens after work, right? That's right? They care about going home to their family and what they do in the evenings, what they do at the weekend and work for them is just what pays the bills. And yeah. that's fine. But then you have another bunch of people who, you know, their ambition is closer to work. They want to make progress. They want to get to the next level. They want to get either because they want to earn more money because they want to drive a faster car or because they want to make change in their industry or because they want to, they want to have the power. There's so many reasons why people make progress through their career, but everybody does it at a different rate. And then you look at school and you see those same people 
Mm-hmm. The people with the ambition, the people with the drive, the people with the talent, the people with the uh, dedication, the people with none of that who just are coasting through. All of those people, different, they're in the same class and you've got to wait for a year. Whatever yeah. happens, you can move up next year. And it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't compute. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with the type of the variety and the diversity of uh, mindsets and drives that we have in the, in the school population. So that's why, so that takes me to the next point in a sense of just like here saying about, you know, the class position in the sense that, hold on a second, in the sense that if you accept that you can't move up, then it's like you says, you come to know your place. Yeah. And then that's something that perpetuates through, can perpetuate through a person's life. But if, like you said, there are, you know, young people out there who have the aptitude, maybe they're lacking a little bit of motivation, a little bit of, you know, direction, but they get the text. Some of them are like, this is too easy. That's why I'm just, you know, doing something completely different because what's on the board there does not engage me. And me being in this class is a reflection of you not testing me. Yeah. So because you can't challenge me, I'm going to just be content to sit here in, in, because I ain't being challenged. Yeah. Yeah. But because yeah. you can't move me out of the class unless you sh- do some shuffling and bring that person and do all this, you can't. Do, so now I can't do anything. I'm stuck now. But yeah. some children, they know that and they get it really, really quickly. And they're like, well, OK, I'm going to just sit here and just chill. Yeah. And I'm going to just get, you know, uh, a C because that's the most that I can get because yeah. the work is not pushing me further enough. Or you got it where we would really like him to go into, like him or her to go to another class, the higher class, but there's no room. Yeah. Yeah. That's so it. What, I mean, um, yeah. I, stepping out of the context of the formal schools, you know, talking about like grade school, I've, I've seen the same, even in, um, you know, in private extracurricular institutions. When I started teaching, I was teaching in language centers, teaching English, mm-hmm. right? Uh, English is a foreign language. And there, in a lot of ways, my field, my background in, in English language teaching has always been at the front of um, advancements and progress in, in teaching because it's separate from the mainstream, right? Because mm-hmm. it's this kind of, it's a commercial industry. I don't like to think about it that way, but the, the fact is it is. It's a commercial industry. It's a private industry. And so it's not governed by the same things that govern the schools. And there are some, there have been some positives to that. You know, it's, it's in high demand all around the world. People want to learn English. So there's a lot of demand for it. It's a massive, uh, you know, industry fiscally speaking so there's loads of money going in there's loads of private interests going in and so you see a lot of research and a lot of you know there's so many methodologies and approaches in the english language uh field that don't seem to penetrate into the into the schools into the mainstream schools because there's this massive divide between the two concepts um and so on the one hand you've got that that you know huge strides in progress but even there where that is just part of the culture of of what language schools are supposed to be. Um, I would see the same thing, you know, kids would come in and the teachers would meet the kids, interview them, maybe give them a test, have some kind of a conversation to determine their level. Because the good thing about it was we're not age-based, we're ability-based. So you go, okay, let's find out their ability, find out their level, put them in the right class. And you do that and you fill in the report and you give it into the admin desk. And then the admin desk would look at it and go, uh, we don't have enough students for that class to open right now. So we'll just put them in the class below or the class above or the class over here. And the whole thing is undermined. Even, you know, in the mainstream, that's happening as a part of the system. We put them where their age dictates, forget everything else. But even mm-hmm. in the private sector where you've got the philosophical freedom you're still boxed in by in that case the the corporate system you know that says we can't afford to open a class or we don't have in we don't meet the quota to open a class for that level now so they're going to have to wait until next year anyway we'll just put them here uh in the meantime we'll park them over there and so it, it seems you know whether you're in the mainstream or not we're seeing a lot of the same problems and it's having the same impact on the students different reasons and rationale behind it but the same impact at the end of the day 
Well, it's true because they, even when, when you see here, uh, you know, where the girl says, I don't know who decides where my kids yeah. belong, but that's none of my business. It's not and the teacher's choice, yeah. That teacher can't do anything. And it's just yeah. like, but you guys are with these kids for hours, like yeah. a day. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, when, when you add up all the hours over like a, a school year, you're talking about a good two, three, four, five days. Yeah. That yeah. with these, so why would we, why would you not have a say? Yeah. Why and would that's you not it, you allow know. them to have yeah, a say you're right. in that's... where they should go? So it's like, he's finding this too easy. Yeah. And it, we're not pushing him. He wants to be pushed. Yeah. Let's put him there. You know, why can't they, why can't teachers have that power? To, you know what I mean? To like move them around Absolutely. because you guys know, know the kids best. And, you know, the the phrase that he uses there, you know, it's not my business, right? Because as he says there, I don't know who's deciding that. It's not me. It's not the teacher. It's it's mm -hmm. it's somebody in the ministry or it's somebody in the, the corporate office. It's not the teacher. So I don't know. It's not my business. But also, you know, the other the other side of that, the extension of that is also... Nobody wants to hear from the teacher, right? When, when a teacher does speak up, when a teacher does come forward and say, uh, I, have, I have an opinion on this, you know, I, I, I've got some insight on this, um, they're then kind of told, that's not your, it's not your job, right? Your job is to teach them in the classroom. My job is to put them in the classroom. Um, and, you know, these, these roles are delineated so clearly you've got the person who writes the curriculum the person who sets up the system all these different departments functioning you know from afar it might look like they're all working together but in a lot of cases the reality is you know you've got different offices and different departments doing different things and the teacher's not really a part of any of them the teacher is just getting whatever the system is however it's designed yeah. the teacher just has to deal with that the teacher's job is to just take what is thrown at you. If there's a curriculum change, if the government writes a new curriculum, then tomorrow you have to teach a new curriculum. And then if the government later decides that that curriculum actually wasn't great, you go back to the old curriculum. The teacher's job is to just take it and deal with it, you know? Yeah, yeah. and the thing is that they're, you know, they're the ones that are at the coal face, so they're getting it, you know, from parents, from students. Exactly right. yeah. Yeah. Now, now, I'm, now I'm confused, which goes back to the first lesson of, of, of confusion. Parents get frustrated because it's just like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and teachers can't always say, well, it's not really down to me because obviously right. they have to defend the interests of, yeah, the, right. of the school. So they can't just be like, well, it's got nothing to do with me and I agree with you. They have to still, you know, toll the party line. So it's hard. Yeah. But then there's another part here where it says, um, the one that really gets me is it says, my job is to make them like being locked together with children who bear numbers like their own. So, you know, for them to be like us and them. Yeah, not like yeah, that's right. everybody that's, right. that's in this building is one team. Yeah. And we might be doing things differently, but the ethos, you know, is what's meant to really link us together. It's not about, that's right. you know, class, you know, 29 versus class 36. We're all one big class, you know, and that's the yeah. thing of, no, you can't leave this. You've got to stay with us. And, and, and that kind of thing, again, you know, perpetuates and goes to say, well, you know, we're not that clever. And, you know, they got that on the test. And yeah, you know, yeah, they yeah, got yeah. that, you know, because they're the alpha class. And we got yeah, that because we're right. not the alpha class. That's but right. then it just makes you think that, okay, well, if I did get a good thing on my, a good score on, on my test, did I really do that? Was that really right, me? Yeah. Or yeah, right. Or is it just part of it? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, just, that, you know? yeah, and I think it's can you can you read that line again? The it's not my job, that last one. So it says, uh, my job is to make yeah. them like being locked together with children who bear numbers like their own, or at least to endure it like good sports. Yeah. So I think that the interesting thing about this one, I think this goes back to what I said at the beginning, actually, about the, the style of, of writing, the style of speech that, you know, it's a very evocative speech uh, yeah. when you delivered it, I'm sure. And it's, it's written in a very kind of confront, confronting style. I think it's in, important to distinguish something here now that we're talking about it, you know, now that we're breaking it down. There's a difference in this line, I think, from the previous line, where when he mm -hmm. says here, it's my job, my job is to uh, make them like it. I think 
that most teachers won't recognize that line as being true in the same way that they might recognize the previous line where it's not my business. Because at this point, you know, he says it's my job. What I would say perhaps here, if I were writing it as not a parody, but as a, a true statement of, of, this, of, the, of affairs, um, I might use the word function. It's my function. Because mm -hmm. the reality is here, you know, teachers wouldn't, wouldn't identify it with that because it sounds horrible and no teacher would want to say, yeah, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and no teacher is doing that in a concrete way, but it's all set up that the function and the output is exactly that, right? Yeah. No one is going into this with the intention of saying, let's make sure by the end of the year, the students feel that way, mm -hmm. but it's set up and implemented so that, you can almost guarantee the students will come out of it feeling that way. And the function of the teacher, you know, the, the role that the teacher plays there is instrumental in, in perpetuating that and ma maintaining that. But I don't think any teacher would, would identify that that's the job they're performing. And I don't think a lot of teachers would consciously realize that that's what they're contributing. But unless you, you know, very explicitly go against the grain, unless you stand against that flow, you are keeping that going yeah well that's the thing because I, and i think that's almost i think is part of the reason why he's delivered that speech in the way is yeah. to really be right up in your face and this is what you're doing yeah uh, whether you realize it or not exactly yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. and then even if it's a deep thought in in the recesses of your mind you have to understand that this is what it actually looks like Yep. from a bird's eye view this is yep. what it actually really looks like so like you said if you understand your function and then you might realize hold on a minute this is actually what i'm doing this is actually really what's what's happening so if yep. you realize that now it's your obligation to do something yeah you either right. like that teacher did you either leave the profession or you know you just fess up and say to the parents look this is what's happening or you do something. So I think what he's trying to do is to try to uh, evoke action. He wants people to take action. Yeah. He wants teachers, to, even if it's a thing where they just say to their kids in their class, look, this is how such and such is. Even if yeah. you're not going to be explicit, we kind of yeah. got to give the kids a little bit of real. You yeah. Yeah. You know, we can't just continue to be, hey, everything's fine. And you know, yeah, you got to do your test. Like, we can't, we got to say, look, when you're outside of school, when you get to like big boy school, big girl school, when you're at secondary school, you're going to be with like 15 and 16 year olds. And when you start, you know, giving the old eye waters and that's not going to work. Yeah. That's going to land you in, in, in a world. Of two. You're going to have teachers that haven't got any time. Yeah. And the teacher's yeah. going to be saying to you, look, you need to hand that in or it's detention. Yeah. And you ain't yeah. got the homework. Okay. Detention. That's yeah. an hour of your, of your time after school. Yeah. I'm gonna, now going to ring your mum and dad. So now it's just, whoa. So, yeah. but we, but we, but we got to prepare them for that. We can't just be like, oh yeah, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and be here, be here and do that and worry about that class and that class. Like you need to worry about the world out, out, outside. So we have to prepare them. So this whole thing of, you know, letting them know about the class position is letting them know that outside in society, people will judge you based on uh, the car you drive, they'll yeah. judge you uh, the, your shoes, they'll judge you on your skin color, they'll judge you on your wages, they'll judge you on the area that you live. So even if all those didn't count, and it was just like, oh, where'd you live? Oh, I live here. Yeah. Oh, I live, oh, oh okay. Yeah. I mean, that's so true. I mean, I went, I was lucky really in the school that I went to, my, my secondary school. I went to a, quite a well-renowned school in, in, in my part of England. Um, and you know it's a high performing school it's a but i essentially was there um you know uh, as a quota really i was not there because i was one of the smart kids that should be there you know um and so i was lucky to be there and i benefited from being there uh, and i'm grateful but i was very much you know everybody knows this is a thing you know about about the same with the class position as well and, and some of the things you mentioned about you know being in the alpha class versus being in the other class um sometimes it's labeled explicitly you know and it's obviously alpha and beta and the others it's obvious it's explicit from the labels but even when it's not 
kids aren't idiots, you know, and it takes you five minutes to realize, I think I'm in the, the low class. I think yeah. I'm in the dumb class, you know, it takes you five minutes to notice. And it was the same, you know, when I was there, it was never, I, what I just said about the reason I was in that school, no one ever told me that. I, that's never been explicitly stated to me, but it became pretty obvious fairly quickly, you know, looking around at the, you know, all of my rich peers whose parents were all doctors and, you know, it became very obvious that I was not like them, you know? Um, and so no one ever put a label on me. No one ever came to me and told me that. And I might be wrong, actually, it's possible I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Um, but it becomes very obvious very quickly. And, 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 and the system is, you know, even in, even in cases where benefits are given, you know, like I say, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to go there. Um, but even then, you know, the system, it's always very obvious that you are in a particular system and you have a particular place in that system. And, uh, you know, until more freedom is given to teachers and to students to put yourself where you want to be rather than to be put where the system wants you to be, um, it's going to train something into you. Uh, again, fortunately, I was, uh, one reason or another, I was able to not be coached by that, to believe I was less than, or to believe I was, you know, belonged in a particular class or a particular segment of society. Um, but, you know, many people are. And when a system is that way stratified, whether it's by ability, whether it's by you know, as you said, skin color, financial background, parental legacy, whatever it is, um, it's a, it's a, it's a class in knowing your place. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, so that's that. So, um, I think just to round up then, so if we say, um, I'll just go over one. So here it says, uh, the real lesson, um, so no, sorry, let's go back under this efficient discipline. Uh, the class mostly polices itself into good marching order. Uh, that's the real lesson of any rigged competition like school. You come to know your place. So, you know, you've got you know, kids that I think that just can't imagine themselves or their peers being anywhere else. Yeah. You know, and uh, just being well. This is this is this this is my lot. You know, this is the most that I can do because yeah. I've been in this foundation class for the last five years. Yeah, from exactly. year seven to year 11 so that means that's it you know yeah. and uh, if anybody else sort of has an idea to to do something else is well why are you not doing the work yeah you know you've got to do the work you know you, yeah. you need do, do you need some help with the homework well like i was saying before that young person might just be like this is too easy for me yeah exactly right there's so and many reasons good. why no. Yeah, an, an individual student who is performing or behaving a particular way, you know, the, the, the front facing behavior, the facade of the behavior is the tip of the iceberg, right? What the reasons underneath that, what's going on inside the student, you can have two students behaving in a very similar way, but for entirely different reasons, Absolutely. right? And as you say, you could have a student, you have two students, one who's really smart and gets it and is so far beyond this material that they're just bored out of their mind with it and they can't be bothered. And then next to them, another kid who is so confused that they don't even know where to begin. But when you look at them, you've just got two kids sitting there not doing the work. And if yeah. you don't investigate the reasons why and what's going on behind it, um, you know, you treat those kids the same way, you put them and then, you know, you treating those kids, you're putting them into a box because the system says, okay, this is the box for you. And the reality yeah. is you've got two very different kids, but by the end of the, you know, they've been, they've been put in a box, told that they are belong in this box. At the end of it, you know, who knows what's going to come out, but if you haven't identified their individual strengths and their individual uh, projections, then you're molding them into something that, that doesn't suit them. And a lot of the time, kids who are underperforming in school, it could be for one reason or another, and there could be many reasons, that underperformance that you're getting from those kids essentially is just, you know, often it's just that something about the school system doesn't work for them. Yeah. And when they get out of the confines of school, which is, as you, you know, it's, it's programming into them, know your place, follow the progression, follow the steps, take the, you know, take the path as it's laid out for you. And that doesn't work for a lot of kids. And when they get out of school, 
they'll be disoriented because nobody has helped them recognize that then the, the system doesn't work for them and it's the system that's failing them and not them that's failing the system mm -hmm. and they get out of school now if we spend more time coaching those kids to recognize their own you know their own direction and their own drive and as soon as they leave school they jump into the right thing for them they get on the way and they would make the progress that they're mm -hmm. destined to make but for a lot of kids they've not been coached that way They've been told one thing that doesn't suit them. And so when they get out of school, they're disoriented. And you get so many people who in their 30s, in their 40s, have this light bulb moment where they realize, oh, that system doesn't work for me, but I can perform in a different way. And we shouldn't be waiting 10, 20, 30 years before we realize, oh, um, now I know how the world works for me. Now I know how I interact with the world that's what school should be about is helping kids find out what works for them but instead it's about telling kids this is what works for the system and yeah. you've got to do it that way yeah. yeah and and society just perpetuates that and just helps that along and you know parents that always want well for their children um you know they feed into that and you know as we've said before you know this is not about you know bashing or anything like that it's just about saying what's really out there and what's really happening um you know because I'm a, I'm a i'm a parent myself you know like my daughter's still at secondary school my son's just left uh secondary school and they've both obviously gone to gone to primary school apart from a couple of years doing home ed um but so you know i i i get it do you know what i mean like i want my daughter to be able to understand herself first and foremost yeah. who she is as a as a, as a person and then it's just like, well, what can you offer society? You know, like what sort of value can you bring? Because you've got a gift. You've got something really good about you that, that I don't have. Yeah. You know, like she's just like ridiculously creative. Like she could get like pieces of paper and foil or whatever and put something and, and make something. I'm like, how did you do that? Do you know what I mean? Where with me, I'm a lot more creative with words. So when she's like stuck on some English stuff, she'll come and say, oh, like, what do I do? How do I get this started? And I'm like, well, maybe we could do this. So I can, and I, but I can do that with, with hardly having to think about it. Right. So we've all got something. So, it, 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 you know, and that's where it goes back to about what we want to do at Educate First is a, in a sense of let's get that really specific. Let's just, let's just open the door straight away. You know, if kids love computer science, and programming and, and and they know like yeah they may change in like two years yep. that yep. might happen but at least we've given them the opportunity to say well do you know what? i was i was studying maths i was studying maths for a whole year and we i did Py pythagoras and calculus and, and then i got bored okay cool yep. now I'll do something else but at least you know that you've reached a certain level at that and it's not really your thing yeah but kids know what they like but because it's like, well, yeah, yeah, because they've got all these other things coming in. Mm -hmm. You've got to yeah. be good at maths. You've got to be good at geography. You've got to be good at science. You've got to be good at English. You've got to be good at uh, P PCHSC, whatever it's called. you got to be good at all of them. Yeah. But you're only interested in one, maybe two. Yeah. 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 So, and, you know, this, 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 we, we said, you know, about how last week we focused on the idea that you've got to do all of these things you've got to be interested in everything you've got to perform well at everything you've got to be at the top level in every subject you're supposed to be interested in all of them you're supposed to care about all of them you're supposed to make yeah. maximum effort in all of them and then this week we also kind of at the same time as telling the students you have to perform in all of these areas you have to do what we also now this this second lesson tells us that also um you get one year to do that <laughs> and then so you've got one year and then at the end of the year regardless you're moving mm -hmm. up right you're moving yeah. on you're doing the next thing uh you know you've got to you've got to focus an equal amount of time and effort on everything for one year and then you've got to move on if you don't like it you've got to wait a year if you do like it and the year's up tough luck it's time to move on now and that's just the you know it, it, whichever way it is we're telling the kids to follow the system by all means and by any measure do not follow your heart your interests your passion your talent don't follow that follow yeah. the system that's and, it. And, that's and, and and you know seeing seeing a school like what you're trying to do with educate first seeing a school that says hey how about we spend a little bit of time 
letting the kids decide what they should be following, what's right yeah. for them to follow. I think that's such a stark opposition to what we're seeing in the in the you know the mainstream, and yeah. uh, it's you know it's exactly what comes up in Gatto's quote. And it's exactly what so many kids need, and sadly, you know, the saddest thing is they need it. They don't even realize that they want it because they haven't been given the opportunity to think about what they want. If we're giving them just the opportunity alone is golden. And then to put them in a school where they can follow that, it's a, it's a whole new world, right? It is, it is, it is. So Carl, I'm going to round up there. Uh, you've been brilliant uh, helping me out, break this Thank down, you. having a nice chat about education, which we could do for many, many hours, I'm sure. And we will in uh, future podcasts. Definitely. So, so next week we're doing indifference. That's the third lesson. And I'll just do a little um, preview for that. So it says uh, the third lesson I teach is indifference. I teach children not to care too much about anything, even though they may want to appear that they do. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's very, um, that's kind of going on about conditioning. Mm -hmm. yeah, and really. um you know that's um, it's quite challenging, really, when you think about it, you know even even now you know I love the work and everything else, but you know to even read that, um, I I know that it's going to challenge a lot of people, you know, a yeah. lot of parents, um, but it's not it's not a lie, you know, no. what he talks about. Maybe some things he might be off in some people's opinion, which is fair enough, um, but overall he's not lying. So right. because it's I've gone brilliant. through it. Yeah, no, I look forward to that. It's going to be a good one, I think. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, man. So we'll catch up next week. Thanks well, to yeah. everyone listening and or watching. And uh, like I said, like, subscribe, uh, hit the notification bell when a new one comes out. And we'll catch you within seven days. Goodbye. See you then. Bye now. See you.